Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and the other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. 
you know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him, and on the third day, on the third day, and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses. <clears throat> and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. from the gospel according to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought Tysus so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us because the entrance to the tomb from the entrance to the tomb. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of, him, of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
In the name of God's Holy Spirit, in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who on this day rose from the dead, redeemed the world, and no matter how hard, how far we fall, will raise us up. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Easter. What a, what a, what a relief to be at this day, at this time. What a shame that we're not outside worshiping together, but the rain made that not possible. And yet, our song is still, Alleluia, Christ is risen, and the Lord is risen indeed. And we are invited to be witnesses with the disciples to the fact and to the reality and the consequences of that resurrection. But let's roll back the clock a little bit first. Earlier in Mark's gospel, we, what we heard today was from chapter 16. It's a very short uh, book, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. We've talked about that before. It's very short. So the very last words of the gospel are the words we heard today. When, uh, when Ed reached the end of that reading, that was it. There are a couple of other possible endings that have been tacked on, but the only text that we know that, that all the ancient sources agree to stopped exactly where Ed stopped in his reading, pointing out that everyone was afraid, and they were. Let's back up and think about that fear. Two chapters before, chapter 14, towards the end, verses 51 and 52, there is a, a strange insertion of these two verses that seem completely out of place to everything else that's going on. Jesus has been arrested inside the garden at Gethsemane, and he's being taken away by Roman authorities. And Jesus's disciples, even then, are beginning to abandon him. They're, been, they're beginning to have their doubts. And Mark's gospel, it's the only one that recounts this story, and we only see it in two small verses, relates the story of a young man who is, who is following close, and it says that he's wearing nothing but a linen cloth. Now, linen, that's a, that's a, a term that in our day conveys a, a quality cloth. We have a, a fair linen on our altar. We use linen when we're trying to do something nice. In that day, that was the cheap stuff. Linen was something you put on because it was all you could afford. And he's wearing a garment called a sindon, and, and uh, uh, I've never actually seen drawings of what they depict it to be, but the way it gets described, the picture that comes into my head is Mowgli walking around. You know, it's kind of a loincloth. That's all he's got. Unclear why they share that detail with us, but they do. And they share with us the fact that he was following closely with Jesus watching what was happening, and the, the authorities who were arresting Jesus saw this, saw that there was someone following behind, and thought, he must be one of their followers. He must be one of the disciples, and so they moved to arrest him, and they tried to grab him, but he was kind of oily. He was, uh, I don't mean literally, he, was, he, he got away, but the way he got, they grabbed him by the one thing they could find, which was his clothing, so he shed that, and he ran away naked. And then that part of the story is over. Two verses said it a lot more succinctly than I just did. They thought he was one of Jesus' followers. They tried to grab him, and he ran away naked. Why insert that detail? What does that have to do with anything about Jesus' arrest? Well, there's a lot of speculation about who this might be. There are a lot of theories. Um, one that I think probably makes a lot of sense is that he represented all the disciples. Uh, the other gospels we know are, are much more wordy. They give a lot more explanation about what's going on. But Mark's gospel makes his point um, succinctly and gets in and gets out. In other places in Mark, we see information being conveyed based on what people are wearing including uh, his description of John the Baptist, describing the way he's dressed, says to the, to the reader who knows, this is a prophet. And in other places, he describes the way Jesus and others are dressed at the, 
at the transfiguration and that Jesus shows up wearing this glowing white robe and that, that information about what he's wearing is supposed to convey a lot. This young man was not wearing much at all, but what he had to wear was taken away from him and he ran away in shame. Now, Matthew's gospel, you'll remember, goes on and on and on about the denials of Peter, that uh, there's all this conversation as the disciples are abandoning him one after another and the excuses that they make, and Peter denying Jesus three times. Mark has that condensed to these two verses of this man who runs away, and he was afraid, and he was naked, and he was humiliated. One of the theories is that this young man, who's sometimes referred to as John Mark, may have been Mark, the author of today's gospel, because he's the only one who really was close to the action at the time. It could have been the evangelist Mark, but we don't know. What we know is that what it says to us is even the few friends Jesus had and the little faith they had and what they wore imparted their lack of faith. Ran away, lost it all, went away in humiliation. And so fast forward to the resurrection day today, and we learn that the, the women are going to, to treat Jesus and to, to administer aloes and, and oils and, and fragrance because He's dead and he's in a tomb and they cared for the bodies in the tombs for as long as they could. Tombs back in that day weren't permanent. The reason you had a stone that went across the, the doors, they expected to open it again and again. For one thing, more than one person would be buried in a tomb. So they had to get in to do that. But for another, they didn't leave them there. They left them there until there was nothing left but the bones. And then they literally gathered the bones together. You'll hear that, that, uh, that expression in scripture a lot of, about someone dying and it'll say that this person was gathered to his people. And that's what they mean. They literally collected and gathered the bones and put them in jars, much as we would put ashes in an urn today. So they were going for the first steps of that to care for the body of Jesus in this tomb that had not yet been used. And you know the story. There's someone there, but it isn't Jesus. Now, who was that who was there? Probably your mind goes immediately because of other gospel accounts of the resurrection to the idea that the person who appeared there was an angel. But Mark doesn't say so. Look at the gospel again, Mark 16. He is not an angel. He's described as a young man. In fact, the word that Mark uses to describe this young man who's now wearing a beautiful white robe at the tomb, this term young man, Mark only uses twice in his entire gospel. One, to describe this young man in the tomb and once to refer to the young man who was following, but not too closely, and left in disgrace. So scholars do wonder, is this the same young man? Did Mark choose his words carefully and deliberately? Is he saying that we who live our lives purporting to be followers of Jesus Christ, but endlessly fail in our efforts to be good disciples, to be faithful to the gospel and true to the vows that we take, and we fail, and we fail, and we fail. And what faith we do have abandons us and abandons our Lord in moments of trial. It's why when the going gets tough, we become fearful. And why not? These women who visited the tomb that day are described the very last words of Mark's gospel, the last thing they have to say to, to put the finale on the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is, they were afraid. In fact, if you read some of the, the suggested other endings, they all say, and they were afraid. It is as if our response to the resurrection, as much as we're 
we know as longtime Episcopalians to say, Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed, indeed, and we sing these joyful hymns. The fact is, this is different from Christmas. When a baby is born and you gather and you say all those joyful things, you kind of know how that's going to play out. You know what to do. You know this is a new beginning. And Easter, Easter, all of our hopes were dashed. Our faithlessness was exposed. We are not worthy of the gift that we've been given. And now what? Now what are we supposed to do in the wake of the resurrection? And what are we literally here supposed to do? Can we gather in our church for Easter? No. And the rain took care of worshiping outside. Can't do that either. We're trying to find a new record, but that's hard to do in a, in a pandemic. Friends who are dear to us are sick, are dying, are fearful and afraid, hospitalized, depressed, mournful, afraid. And that's normal. But let me offer you a thought. If that character, that young man, represents the disciples and ultimately all of us in his own faithlessness and running away at the moment of truth in fear, the resurrection does more than bring Jesus back to life. The resurrection clothes us with the honor and the glory of sharing in Jesus' resurrection, in sharing in Jesus' kingdom, in sharing in Jesus' immortality, that we will live forever, not in this body, but we will live forever. Will there still be violence? Will there still be injustice? Will there still be illness? And yes, will there still be death? Yes to all of those things. There are. They do not have the last word. And as powerless and as afraid as we may feel, just like that young man who ran away humiliated as we have so many times, just like him, we are the witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. We are the ones clothed in white robes of righteousness, not of our own making, but given to us by the one who sacrificed everything for us so that we could share an abundant life forever. And that's exactly what's going to happen. That is exactly what we are called to do. Our fear makes perfect sense. If you can, set it aside, set it aside and wear those white robes proudly because Christ is risen, and so are you. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Let us pray. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, who made this most holy night to shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, Stir up in your church that spirit of adoption, which is given to us in baptism, that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O Heavenly Father, who hast filled the world with beauty, open our eyes to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, we may learn to serve thee with gladness for the sake of him who, through whom all things were made, thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be, un to be united with Christ forever. Amen. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than anything we can think or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter.